And now we'll continue with our introductory hymn, which is hymn 204, Truly He Comes to Us, hymn 204.
And now let us continue with the gathering of the community. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. Let us praise our God who has given us life and hope by raising Jesus from the dead. Let us rejoice then, even in our distress. We shall be counted worthy when Christ appears. O God, you have claimed us as your own and called us from our darkness into the light of your day. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed, alleluia. We now continue with the song. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I am hard pressed. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you worship dumb idols and run after false gods? Know that the Lord does wondrous wonders for the faithful. When I call upon the Lord, he will hear me. Tremble then and do not sin. Speak to your heart in silence upon your bed. Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Many are saying, oh, that we might see better times. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when grain and wine and oil increase. I lie down in peace. At once I fall asleep. For only you, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. We now continue with the first reading. Our first reading is taken from the Acts of the Apostles. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by your own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health, in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, God. We now continue with the responsory, and if you can see the screen, you can join me with the uh, in the where it's bolded, but do remain uh, muted. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Christ is risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Death is swallowed up in victory. The trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised. Where, O oh death, is your sting? We shall not all sleep, but we shall be, sh be changed. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your sting? We now have the second reading. Sylvain, you have to unmute. 
Now, can you hear me again? Yes. Start all yes. over. Yes, the please. Second reading. First John chapter three, verse one to seven. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children. Now, what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have his hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of, of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins. And in him, there is no sin. There is no sin. And him, uh, for, where am I? Okay. In him, <laughs> there is no sin. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins. And in him, there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to continue now with the canticle, the song of Zechariah, which is uh, hymn number 12 in our prayer, in our hymn books, hymn number 12. Fred, are you going to unmute? Okay, well, let's, uh, we, you can remain muted. I'm going to sing it. You can sing along with me. Sorry, my voice is a little cracky this morning. We bless you, God of Israel. You come to set your...
read. Our third reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, starting on the 24th chapter, the 36th verse. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of the Lord. And now we're going to uh, continue with the sermon rather than the affirmation of faith. Of faith. <clears throat> Holy God, guide my words and our understanding. Amen. So uh, I don't know if any of you saw this very weird little uh, article in the Gazette a couple of days ago. I saw it online. So uh, maybe you saw it if those of you who've been flipping through the, the Gazette about a, a very, uh, a very uh, scary croissant. Did you see that? Uh, anyone see that? There was apparently in Poland, there was um, a group of people who were quite terrified at this very weird uh, animal that was outside on a, on a branch. They were looking at it and they were, and it wasn't moving and they thought, oh, maybe it's an iguana and something's weird about this animal. They were looking at it uh, very, very carefully and everybody was staring at it and they noticed, oh my goodness, it doesn't have a head. And they're thinking, oh, what animal is this? It doesn't have a head. And then there's, oh, it doesn't have any, any arm, any uh, paws or legs. What's the matter with this animal? Everybody was terrified. Like just not just one person, but everybody was terrified that this animal is some kind somehow going to squeeze its way into into a window and terrorize the people. People were keeping their windows closed. They were in terror. Finally, they called the Polish equivalent of 911. And they came, the animal inspectors came to see this animal and they said, Oh yeah, it looks a really a very creepy looking animal with this brown skin and but no head. And what is this? And then they got, got a little closer to, with, you know, tentatively went to get this very scary animal. It was a croissant. It was a, a croissant that had been stuck somehow up in a tree, but no one expects a croissant on a tree, right? So they didn't, they thought it was some kind of creepy animal. So it has a, I, I can just imagine the relief of those people who, uh, who realized that all the, this fearful, unnatural thing that was stuck in that tree uh, was something that was actually predictable, well, maybe not that predictable, but certainly understandable as something not scary at all. And I think that, you know, we have this, this human propensity of uh, being both terrified and kind of weirdly excited about things that are unnatural. And you see this all the time with, with ghost stories. I mean, we all have a ghost story that either in our family or we ourselves have kind of uh, experienced where, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck will lift and you think, oh my goodness, you know, people have told me that they, uh, people in this congregation have told me that yes, you know, after uh, one of their relatives died, they actually saw that relative standing at the foot of their bed or they've, uh, they've had that experience of something strange and unnatural that has happened and of course there's there's lots of uh <clears throat> there's lots of interest in our society about that kind of things there's movies and like horror movies or movies about the occult or the supernatural it's everywhere in our society and um for some of us like i can't watch those movies i find them way too creepy uh anything that even when i was well when i was a little girl obviously but even now people say oh let's put my daughters let's put on a horror movie and no way <laughs> one time there's a movie a horror movie called the rain 
the I think it's called The Ring. Has anyone anyone ever seen that? The Ring was a was a, a movie that was put out many years ago now, a Jap Japanese movie where there was like a ring that appears, some horrible thing. Anyway, in my in my living room, one of my lights projects a kind of a ring of light on the ceiling. It's very innocuous. But my daughter made the mistake one day of saying to me, oh, mom, that, that light looks just like the light in the ring, which I've never seen. That was enough to freak me out. And now, even now, I look at that light reflected in my living room and I think, oh, that's a creepy ring. It's not, it's just the light reflected. Anyway, so we have this propensity to kind of see mysterious patterns in the world and we can assign them good or evil as, you know, depending on where we are in the world and uh, how we are in our, in our minds and souls at that point. So it's not an unusual thing that happens in our world, but on the other, other hand, our society, especially in the past 200 years, I think not too much more than 200 years, has been very, very preoccupied in making sure that things are predictable. We want things not to be mysterious. We want things to be predictable. So we have been looking desperately at God's creation to figure out the predictability like we all know from the beginning of creation we've all known that the sun comes up and then it goes down and the stars are there some at some point we didn't know why but things were uh some things were very predictable but our society has been desperately trying to find out more predictability in things so if you add this compound to this solution it's going to do this and it's not going to do that we find that very reassuring. We call it science, by the way. We find that very reassuring so that we can look at things, we can look at God's creation and see how it's predictable. Well, God loves us. Our, our creation is predictable. Thank goodness. It is predictable. There's lots of things in our creation that's predictable. And we spent the last 200 years trying to figure out what those things are and manipulating that predictability so we can cause other things to happen so if we plug in a light for example we know uh, the light is going to shine and if we turn a, a switch we know that something's going to happen because we have looked at the predictability of nature and use that predictability to obtain power over nature this, this is you know the power of science it doesn't mean that it doesn't we haven't really created anything we've already just looked very carefully at what creation is already there so um, we find this, our society finds this very, very reassuring. We don't, we're not too fond of mysterious things in our society. So hence, when we see a, a croissant in a tree, we're freaked out because uh, until we find out it's a croissant, then it's okay. This idea, this idea that the predictability of creation uh, is something that, uh, that we can cling to is fundamental to how we see the world. There's nothing wrong with that. It, it's, it's good because there's a lot of things in our lives that are not predictable that we can't understand. And for example, if we're looking at one of these horror movies or thinking about the zombie apoc apocalypse or whatever it is that people are worried about these days, uh, we can say to ourselves, well, phew, it's not real. It's just a story. You know, it's not something we have to actually worry about and think about because there are no ghosts. There is, there are no uh, zombies. Now we can, we can relax because you know, science has told us that this doesn't exist. It's not part of the, what's probable and possible in the world. And so few. On the other, other hand, we know that there are things in this world that are not predictable, or if they are predictable, they're not controllable. I mean, we've been reading and thinking a lot about volcanoes, like the volcano that, that erupted in St. Vincent's. And we know that even though it's predictable, it's not controllable. And so we are still uneasy. So because human beings don't like to be uneasy, they do, they, they find a way, we find a way of making sure that whatever we can to control things we do. So that, that's just part of our human nature. Of course, uh, in the first century, it wasn't the same. When Jesus and the apostles were around, there wasn't that focus that we have over the past 200 years of making sure that uh, we examine predictability. They were happier with, uh, with mystery. 
it was, uh, they didn't mind that they didn't know how a flower grows or, or how electrons work or the other things that, that preoccupy us now it wasn't a big deal for them. And that, uh, that has uh, a good things and bad things. It made it easier, I think, for people to have faith in God, uh, to have faith in God's love. Because uh, when everything is kind of mysterious, when we experience, when human beings experience goodness and experience um, the wonders, then we are happier to see those wonders as being a manifestation of God. We see a beautiful sunset. We think God is good. We don't think with the way we can now, oh, it's, it's particles in the atmosphere where the light is shining off the particles in the atmosphere. And that's why we have a sunset. And it's true. But it doesn't, that's not where the focus was back in the day. They didn't know that. They didn't care about that. They look at the sunset and they think God is good. What beauty is created. It doesn't mean we can't look at the sunset and say God is good. What beauty is created. Uh, even though we know that it's particles in the atmosphere. One doesn't erase the other one doesn't preclude the other so we still have this idea but back in the, the days it was maybe a little bit easier for for people to uh to search for god and god's mystery because the world was already pretty mysterious and that's you know that's when people were searching for the meaning to the mystery they were looking for some explanation because that's what we do and uh, we have the idea of looking beyond ourselves into the mystery. They had the pagan religions at that time, which was, of course, the, the mainstream religion. It was like the, the mainstream religion at that time. Uh, of course, in Jerusalem, there was uh, mostly Roman religion. So we had the, the Roman gods that were worship, worshipped, and that was mainstream. And, of course, we had the, the Jewish religion there. And so the god of Isaac, Abraham, and, and Jacob was also there and that was the way people expressed and explained uh, the nature, um, the mystery of what they ex experienced in creation. Um, so we had that, it was, all, it was always there, always a, a search for meaning. And of course we do see the beauty and the, the glory of creation, but we also have this, the, the darkness, which was very evident for that. These days we kind of, we like to um, explain away the darkness by saying it's not really dark, it's this or that or the other. But back in the day, uh, they were very um, aware of the idea of evil, the idea of um, uh, the forces of evil were very much uh, in the forefront of their thought the same way as the forces of good were. So we had this idea of, of evil manifesting itself in creation also. And we have Paul especially uh, talking about the powers and principalities of uh, actual evil in the world that was uh, not only malevolent, but also um, focused on like it had it had focus, it had purpose. And the purpose was to uh, make people uh, act in a way that was against God. So this is of evil, which we know. Now, um, back in those days, they, there was that struggle between good and evil. And what we know is that when Jesus came into the world, the whole point was to make sure that the people of that time were aware, well, I don't, that's not the whole point, but one of the strong points was to make sure that uh, the people at the time were aware that God had vanquished evil, that there was good and evil in the world, yes, but that love is stronger than hate, that the light is stronger than the darkness, that good vanquishes evil. And I think that one of the, the precious uh, teachings of the resurrection is that it was maybe um, a, a little bit different the way it was perceived back with the apostles, but certainly it, it's a precious learning that we have as Christians. Now, I was uh, just last week, I was uh, participated in a talk that Rowan Williams gave. Um, <clears throat> Rowan Williams gave this talk uh, in the, in Britain, and of course, because of uh, because of Zoom, I was able to participate in that, and I was privileged to hear him. He's one of my uh, he's one of my spiritual uh, stars. He's the, one of the people that I that I look to for spiritual nourishment. And he said, along uh, him and Paul and myself in agreement, said that 
you know, without the resurrection, we we don't we don't have much. You know, Christians without the resurrection don't have much to offer with the with the world. The idea that Jesus in his body showing the people that was that were with him that love is stronger than death, manifesting that reality that love was stronger than death. Um, in the incarnation of that truth, which is our precious gift that we have. Uh, the pagans didn't have that. Even the, even the Jewish religion doesn't have that. It does, you have, well, of course it does because of the, the prophet prophecies and the Psalms as Jesus himself referred to, uh, but it's, it's made more focused and manifested in the in the body and the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we've got that. We have the resurrection, which is the most important uh, knowledge that we have to offer about the uh, the importance of love over hate, of life over death. So we 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 know that part of our faith as a Christian. And when we look at that faith, when we look at at that we understand the, the, the apostles at that time just coming to a realization of that truth because they were still um, in the old way of seeing things that, that life and death uh, were absolutes, that they were, they were, in, they were uh, in conflict with each other, that uh, you didn't know whether good was going to win or evil was going to win. It just it wasn't clear that that God would triumph, even though it's in there in scriptures. It wasn't it wasn't clear that uh, that love would triumph, that life would triumph, that uh, goodness would triumph over evil. So it wasn't clear, except with Jesus, it became clear. It became obvious um, that Jesus had suffered death. He had suffered all of the pains and miseries of death, but here he was. Now, of course, their first response to this reality that Jesus being in the midst of them was, no, 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 I'm going to go back in the other way of, of thinking this, this guy's a ghost. He's one of those creepy things that we can't, uh, that, that are manifestation of the powers and the principalities. Uh, he's not to be worshipped or loved. He's to be feared because this is creepy. This is unnatural in a way that God's nature doesn't allow. And Jesus very clearly, very hurriedly uh, made sure that they understood that that wasn't true, that he was not one of these creepy ghosts, but he, that he was a new reality, a new thing, but a, a, a holy thing, a, a natural and supernatural at the same time thing. This, this idea of, of Jesus's body as being both natural and beyond nature is one of the profound things that we have with the resurrected Christ. Resurrected Christ's body is mysterious and, and uh, tangible at the same time, imminent and eminent. So at the same, same time in his own resurrected body, he shows the, the reality of earthly existence and the reality of spiritual existence at the same time. Very precious learning that we have in Christianity through Jesus. And the, the apostles saw that they were able to, to, to respond to him as in his earthly form. He ate a piece of fish. He showed them he, he, they could touch him. He was tangible. And yet they knew that he had died. He showed them the, the signs of his torture on his hands and his feet. So that was, that was visible and yet he was there. So this mystery made manifest is a, one of the uh, pillars of our faith and God in God's graciousness allowed that. God in God's graciousness gave us that gift so that we wouldn't have to just take it at the word of the uh, of the of the prophet and the in scripture we could actually see it in 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 the life of jesus in his death and not only that you know they not only did jesus come to show the apostles that he was still alive that that life had conquered death not only was that apparent, but notice we notice that when he came he also showed them his hands and feet and interestingly 
he didn't show us that his hands and feet were made were made clear and clean. He didn't show us, he showed us they were healed, but that they were still there. I think that's such an important point. He didn't negate what had happened to him. He didn't make it so that it wasn't true anymore. His hands were not restored to the way they were before. His feet were not restored to the way they had been previously. They were healed. What had been horrible, torturous, very, very negative thing was now healed. And I think for us, that is so important. In our lives with God, things will happen with us. Things will torture us. Things will p- cause us pain. Things will hurt us. There's none of us that gets to a, to a certain age without knowing that reality, that we have pain in this world. But we also know that God will heal us, heal our pain, will redeem our pain, not take it away, but redeem it. And that I think is some one of the most meaningful things that we learn from, from the story of Jesus's death and resurrection. There's many things we learn from that, of course, but the idea that Jesus prevailed over the darkness and the light vanquished the darkness and that things were healed. And when we hear the in the Acts of the Apostles, all these acts of healing that happen, it's through the name of Jesus, through the reality of Jesus, through what Jesus brought into the world, the strength and the power of that healing. And, and it's so beautiful because not only is that healing given to the people who are uh, who have suffered, but that healing is offered to the people who create the suffering. When Peter was talking to the the people and he was saying to them, you're the ones, you're the ones, you're the reason why Jesus was was tortured and died. It's because of you. But turn turn from your sin and be healed. Even the torturers, even the ones who committed sin can be healed by the love of Jesus, by the reality of the resurrection. And because that is true, you know, Jesus didn't come with his and show his, uh, the apostles, his wounds and say, oh, look at this. Look at those horrible people. What did they do to me? Vengeance. I want vengeance. No, he didn't. His healing power was made available even to those people who tortured him. Even on the cross, he said, God, forgive them. They know not what they do. He never, he doesn't call for vengeance against against the hurts given to him he calls for healing when we go through the world with our pain we will never go through the world world without pain i don't think there's anybody in the world maybe a, a few golden people who go through the world with no pain but for the rest of us whether it's physical or emotional or mental or whatever it is we have to deal with reality of pain in the world But we also, because of our faith, we deal with the reality of healing and love in the world also. There is the understanding that Jesus has brought light into the world, has manifested God's light in the world. And we as followers of Jesus are children of God as Jesus was a child of God. And as as children of God, we show our wounds but we show our healing and that healing will heal the world. And this is the joy of the resurrection. Amen. And now we'll continue with the affirmation of faith. The Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, as we remember those gifts given, those gifts which we give, those gifts that, is, that are offered to us from our loving God, let us pray. Creator of all, you wash away our sins in water. You give us new birth by the Spirit and redeem us in the blood of Christ. As we celebrate the resurrection, renew your gift of life within us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. And now we will sing the festive doxology. we continue with the prayers of the people. Let us offer our intercessions, petitions, and thanksgivings, saying, Redeemer of Israel, hear our prayer. May we live as those who believe in the triumph of the cross. Redeemer of Israel, hear our prayer. May all people receive the good news of Christ's victory. Redeemer of Israel, hear our prayer. May those born to a new life in the waters of baptism know the power of Christ's resurrection. Redeemer of Israel, hear our prayer. May those who suffer pain and anguish find healing and peace in the compassion of Christ, remembering especially those who have asked for our prayers. And today we pray especially for Robert Palmer, Valbir Sani, Ken Burke, Leroy Cumberbatch, Francis, Lyndon Rogers, Sandy Bramble, Lucette Charles, Steve Jordan, Nancy Camel, Mary Blunt, Hilary <coughs> Hyde, Greta, Lillian Jackson, Valerie, Joy, Jocelyn Corbett, Phoebe Roper, David Furlott, Bunny Story, Laurent Duc de Serre, Andrew Hutchison, Michael Robson. And we also pray for ongoing support for Jean Noel Rocher, Mary File, Margaret Green, Carmen Fredericks, Alice, Mel Doherty, Bernetta Drakes, Althea Caesar. Elvalina Pert, Marguerite, Estina Taylor, Phyllis Walcott, Josh and Andrea, Kiren Skinner, Fran Gahan, Elsie Adams, Ivan Austin, Pamela King, Audrey and Erla Sandiford, Hedy and Carell, Bill Griffith, Barbara and family, Maureen Phillips, Maureen Williams, I'm sorry. And we pray for all who are separated from their loved ones. We pray for Jocelyn and Pascal and all refugees that they may find hope and feel God's love every day. 
and back to the intercessions. May we be united in Christ's undying love with all who have passed through the gates of death. Redeemer of Israel, hear our prayer. Now continue with the collect of the day. Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, you raised Christ from the dead and glorified him at your right hand. Let the words of scripture fulfilled in Jesus, your son, burn within our hearts and open our minds to recognize him in the breaking of the bread. Amen. And now gathering, gathering our prayers and praise into one, let us pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will, will be done be on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. And we close our service today with singing the final hymn, which is 218, hymn 218, Rejoice, Angelic Choirs, Rejoice. All right, so that concludes our service. Just a couple of 